All right. Welcome, everyone, to episode 22 of the podcast. And this week, we're exploring a topic that, in all honesty, I don't know much about. You know, as a straight white guy, there's a lot of stuff I don't understand about queerness and gender in science fiction and fantasy, not through lack of wanting to know, but rather through lack of personal experience. So that's why I'm so thankful to have these guest authors with me today, as they'll help me broaden my mind to better perceive the ways in which queerness, sexuality, gender, and that kind of stuff is represented across the SFF landscape. And up front, if anything I say comes across as, you know, ignorant or insensitive, I apologize, but please call me out if you feel like something needs to be corrected, countered, that kind of thing. For me, this panel is ultimately about teaching and learning, and I know I want to learn, and I hope everyone listening and watching wants to learn as well. So without further ado, my wonderful panelists, uh, all making their first appearances on the show. First up is C.L. Clark, writer, teacher, adventurer, and thrower of kettlebells. She's the author of The Unbroken, book one in the Magic of the Lost trilogy. She's also an award-winning editor, Nebula Award nominee, and her work has appeared on Tor.com. Uncanny Magazine, and more. So happy to have you here, Sheree. How are you? Ah, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I love you guys. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to have you here too. And I'm happy that we're already starting off on a positive note. Uh, also with us is author, poet, composer, and teacher, Rika Aoki. She's the author of Light from Uncommon Stars, Seasonal Velocities, and more. Her work has also been published in a number of queer and mainstream publications and anthologies, and she's appeared in the documentaries Diagnosing Difference and Riot Acts, and she also wrote for the wrote and acted in the award-winning film Transfinite. So thank you so much for joining us, Rika. How are you? Oh, I'm really happy to be here. Looking forward to chatting with everyone. Awesome. Oh, me too. Thank you so much. And next is Khan Wong, a proud author of Queer SFF. His debut novel, The Circus Infinite, was released this past spring through Angry Robot Books. And he has a diverse background, including publishing poetry, playing cello in a folk rock duo, touring with a circus, producing circus art shows in San Francisco, and more. So I'm really excited to hear about some of that stuff. Uh, but welcome to the show, Khan. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm very happy to have you here. And lastly, we have Al Hess with us. Al is a writer and artist, crafting cozy and uplifting stories with queer, trans, and neurodiverse representation. His works include the Post-Apocalyptic Traveler series and the 1930s-flavored dystopian series Hepcats of Boise. Al also does portraits in both pencil and oil paint, and his art is seriously beautiful, so I recommend everyone go check that out. And his next book, his first traditionally published book, is out in the spring of 2023, and that's called World Running Down. So welcome. Thank you for being with us, Al, and congratulations on your uh, first traditionally published book. Thank you. I appreciate being here. And uh, Khan and I are publishing siblings because we we both have books coming out with Angry Robot. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I want to give a shout out to Angry Robot because they're very cool people over there. And there's also a ton of diversity uh, under their umbrella, which I, I really appreciate. Uh, but to start things off, I would like to know, I'll ask each of you in turn, uh, what does queerness or being queer mean to each of you personally? And if you want to elaborate on this, however much you're comfortable with, what has your journey been like in terms of queerness, uh, sexuality, gender, that kind of thing? Shrey, uh, do you mind jumping in on this question and then letting us know, you know, what it means to you, what your journey has been like, that kind of thing? Um, well, I don't, I, I'll say first, I don't know that it's a, I don't know if I see it really as a, a journey with a, a specific endpoint because it's something that I personally think that I'm always exploring as, as, you know, different things happen in the world, different things happen to me. Uh, but I, I mm -hmm. actually think I was in an, I was in an interview recently where, um, I think I kind of discovered while I was talking that when I was a kid, my gender was just somebody who has a sword and like, that was it. That's what I knew about myself. And so yeah. was my sexuality. It was somebody who could have a sword. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, um, yeah, actually it was the wheel of time. It was, it was some, it was a wheel of time podcast. And I think it really cemented itself while I was reading those books. Like I was reading wheel of time and I was reading Dragonlance. Um, I discovered Kitty Ara and Avienda and I was like, Ooh, yeah, that's it. 
I mean, so part of the what I realized was that queerness was how much, like, when I expressed this sort of desire to fight, desire to have swords and spears and whatever, um, even like use my fists in any kind of violent fashion, like that was really taboo in like to my my parents, especially the women in my family. And um, so honestly, I think like that sometimes that might have been the queerest part of me. Uh, and later I realized that part like, you know, other stuff in terms of like, oh, also wanting to kiss the girl you save is also part of the queerness that you should, that's also not allowed. Um, and so, <laughs> so much of my, my queerness and also the, the fiction that I write is, is exploring that very particular aspect of, 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 of violence in a female body, uh, or, or even like as someone who's perceived as a woman that like violence as that kind of person and, um, physical violence in particular, but what's allowed and what's not. and. And also, like, you know, who you do get to roll in the proverbial hay with. Um, but I think that's kind of where I'm th- what I'm thinking about now in my writing as well. So a roundabout was, sort of loose answer. but Yeah, but I mean, it, it seems like fantasy was kind of an integral part of, you know, you finding your identity. And then now it's come full circle because you're able to write your own queer fantasy yeah. and yeah, hopefully definitely. help help uh you know people in the future to kind of think yeah this is good this is okay this is me this feels right that kind of thing mm-hmm. yeah what, you know. and con con what about you what has your experience been like and and you know what is what is queerness to you well um i knew that i understood that i was different from other kids at a very young age mm-hmm. um and but I didn't really understand like what that meant or how or anything until I, until I was a little bit older. But yeah. um, I did used to get you know um, crushed out on boys and like it, like it, during the summertime when like boys would run around with their shirts off and especially like older boys like you know it gave me a little tickle but I didn't understand what that meant you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also when I was a little kid. <laughs> yeah. Also, when I was a little kid, I used to play this game. Um, I, whenever I was home alone, when my parents were not in the house, um, so my mom used to make these bead curtains, and um, and she had, and there were some that um, we stopped hanging, but they were still around, you know. And there were these. I won't go into too details. They were beads, translucent beads, and I used to. Um, <laughs> drape them like when i was home alone i would take these beads and drape them all over my body and i called myself the space princess <laughs> and like would parade around the house like trailing my beads around um so and i but i knew this was not a thing that typical boys my age were doing you know so i mean so i i, I kind of feel mm-hmm. like i i came into my queerness without the having the vocabulary for it at a very young age um you know, and at the time when I when I came out as gay, um, I did identify as as gay for a while um, until um, I came, I came to San Francisco in the early '90s and got involved with this activist group called Queer Nation, and it was at that point where it I realized that the moniker or label, you know. Um, queer just felt more right to me than gay. Um, And for a a number of different reasons. I mean, one, I appreciate it better because I I feel like it's more inclusive of other, um, I feel like it's um, more inclusive. uh, It's inclusive of of multiple identities um, other than just like, you know, where gay is kind of very narrow when you, get down to it um and for me queerness is um kind of goes beyond sexuality and gender identity and and there's a a different it's like a different mindset um and view of reality altogether from non-queer if if that makes sense that that's beyond just those um 
beyond sexuality and gender, but also has to do with, but also can um, approach or address how we think about um, race and ethnicity, how we think about class, how we, you know, how we think about all kinds of other um, marginalizations and just how people can be in the world. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, Mm -hmm. I I really appreciate you sharing that. And I think that this is something that's going to come up a lot while, while we're talking is, you know, um, how science fiction and fantasy are able to expand the, the diversity in the way that people relate to themselves as well as the world around them, you know, and, uh, we'll get everyone else's, uh, uh, takes on this as well a bit later on, but Al, I'll toss this over to you if you want to share, you know, what queerness means to you and what your journey has been like, uh, whatever you're comfortable with sharing. So it, it took me a really long time to realize who I was. Um, I had these feelings of being trans in the back of my mind ever since I was a child, but I didn't have, I didn't have that term. I didn't have the vocabulary to uh, be able to define what I was feeling. And I think that um, growing up in a conservative religious family and community um, had a lot to do with that, that I just, I didn't have these words to describe um, who I was. And once I got married to, I, I got married to a cis hetero guy and had a child and that made it even harder. Um, mm. I felt like I didn't have the room to explore what I was feeling. So I just crammed it down as hard as I could and and tried to be this perfect housewife. I, um, I went over the top with like hyper femininity and I dressed like a fifties, um, pinup every single day because it felt like this costume and kind of like, I was just putting on this, you know, persona every day. And, and it wasn't until, um, my marriage dissolved that I finally had some breathing room to figure myself out. So I, I cling fiercely to the term queer now and the other labels that fit me because um, because I, I finally know who I am and I, and I feel like it gives me this sense of belonging and helps me find other people like myself. And I, I don't think that labels are made to cram us into a restrictive box, um, but they should instead be able to help us understand more about ourselves and um, find our community. Mm-hmm. That's a really good jumping off point uh, for my next question, which is I'll, I'll let you continue since you're on that vein of what uh, makes science fiction and fantasy so uh, well suited for queer stories. And then at the same time, why you yourself uh, felt like this is the literary avenue that I want to push forward in, in order to tell my stories. I think the unfortunate truth is that we live in a world where being queer is still not universally accepted. Um, you know, people say that bisexual people aren't gay enough. They accuse asexual people of being broken or being immature. They say that being non-binary is a trend. And I'm constantly seeing just rampant transphobia everywhere I look mm-hmm. on the internet and in the news. And, um, you know, I've been told that I'm an abomination and that I don't deserve basic human dignity. And so these things are still out there in society. And in fantasy and sci-fi, there's this assumption of the fantastical. You can make any world that you want. And so you're capable of creating a world where where no one's homophobic or transphobic. And, um, you know, no one's going to bat an eye when two guys kiss in public or somebody's using they, them pronouns. Um, one of my self-published series, my Hepcats of Boise series, is like that. It's just a queer norm world where it's accepted. And I think that um, fantasy and sci-fi are also perfect genres for being able to explore these kinds of concepts in an allegorical sense. So like The Matrix, for example, you're existing in this world where you know you aren't who you've been led to believe that you are. and knowing the truth about yourself is going to make things infinitely harder for you, but you want to be able to know what that truth is anyway. Um, And I think that might, those kinds of stories might be more palatable for people who are resistant to um, (laughs) having like, you know, like the idea of being queer or other concepts just stated plainly, um, having it wrapped (laughs) up more into a a story that they can um, 
you know, more of a, a fictional story might be easier for them to digest. Mm-hmm. And, and I think too, that, um, because you have to embody these characters while you're writing, it's, it's really easy to explore yourself that way. Um, and, and I did a lot of that when I first started writing in the beginning, I was writing these gay male characters without being able to explain why. And yeah. now when I look back on it, it's incredibly obvious what my subconscious was doing, but even though it wasn't a straightforward path, mm-hmm. um, it's taken me a really long time to figure out who I was. And so I, it, if you look through my, my backlist of my books, you can see that progression kind of in my discovering who I am um, until I have gotten to the point now where, where I do feel confident that I know who I am. But I think, yeah. you know, we're always discovering ourselves and trying to figure out who we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, down the line, we'll get into sort of the, the, SFF community and and how these queer stories are evolving and what we'd like to see about their futures. But Khan, I'll toss it over to you as well, just to comment on why you feel that science fiction, fantasy are genres that fit well for queer stories. And and also, you know, what were the genres that you decided to jump into to tell your own stories? Uh, Well, I think mostly, I mean, it comes down to that, like the um, kind of goals of science fiction and fantasy are to imagine other worlds of, that are not this world that we live in, mm-hmm. and um, and that's always really just kind of captured my imagination ever since I was a little kid and was you know introduced to the Narnia books. <laughs> I mean, so I kind of was indoctrinated pretty young, I think. <laughs> Go through the wardrobe, right. Con. Go through the wardrobe. Right. Um, and, there, and of course, there was a certain escapism. I mean, I mean, that was the first draw. Obviously, was the, was the escapism aspect. Um, well, I mean, it's probably it may not be obvious for many other people, but for me, that that's that's kind of where it started. Um, but then, as I started reading more, um, that I encountered these stories that 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 were asking big bigger questions and and i saw how these genres could do more than just be mere escapism mm-hmm. um and it i so when i started writing when i started taking writing seriously i was writing poetry and short stories but very much in the literary vein uh than working in these genres and it felt, um, and while there was certainly space to address uh, issues of sexuality and identity, it, it, I felt locked into uh, um, having to approach it in a sort of activist mode. Mm. Um, and, and, and that might have been my limitation and not necessarily something that was being imposed from the outside but but that that, that is a, a pressure right. that i that i felt um in, in particular when i was seeing like the kind of writers that were getting notice in that you know realm um and but you know as a reader it was my fantasy always that were that were my go-tos and um when I had the kind of breakthrough moment of, you know, maybe I can address these issues in these genres, it it, it was a very freeing um, experience. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine just like the the freedom that one experiences just through the act of reading, but being able to uh, take your own experiences, uh, you know, with your queerness or your sexuality expand upon them beyond just a reader and being able to write down, you know, and, and use words to figure out like, what does this mean to me? Uh, kind of like, I mean, just for me as a writer, like it's this process of sorting through the shit in my head. And so (laughs) it feels very cathartic in that sense. And I feel like regardless of whatever any individual has gone through, if they, identify with science fiction and fantasy as a reader, but then take it to the next level as a writer. There's 
endless, endless possibilities that you can uh, explore and um, just use as a, as a mechanism to For figure sure. yourself out, you know? Another element is um, I, I like writing queer characters um, where the, their queerness is not the point of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, it can, it, the story can be about anything and the characters just happen to be queer and they exist in a world where queerness just is and it's not, you know, a huge deal. And um, I feel like it's a little easier to get away with that when you're writing fantastical worlds. Um, I mean, certainly you could do it. I mean, certainly we're seeing more and more stories that are, are not set in fantastical worlds that are that are like that but mm -hmm. um i don't know i i, I mean so schitt's creek is you know one of have been one of my favorite recent series Love it. So and good. one of the things that i like about it is that is it does what i'm talking about where the queerness just is a factor in the world and it's not a thing but that in itself almost makes it a fantastical world because Mm -hmm. we, as we know reality is not like that so and so i mean so that <laughs> yeah. so that's an element of it <laughs> of it of it too you know yeah <laughs> it's like i'm 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 from canada and schitt's creek is definitely sort of like a surrealist twist on, <laughs> on the country that I, that I grew up on grew up in and uh sheree I'll, I'll toss it to you the same question if you <laughs> want to build on what uh con and rika have been talking about yeah um that actually that last comment actually made me think but i feel like i should go through my entire thought process so i don't just drop you guys into the deep end go for um it. so this my answer to this would probably change in a, in a different interview but since we already started by talking about how i realized that my gender and sexuality are both like person with sword um I, I think that's part of what what drew me to SFF as a reader and also as a writer. So like, I mean, like one of the bread and butter tropes of the the fantasy genre is a uh, girl dresses up as boy to go do fighty things um, from mm -hmm. like stowing away on a ship and becoming a ship's boy to... Um, Tamora Pierce's Atlanta books. Uh, it's just, it's just so baked into, um, like, I mean, Joan of Arc going back all the way to that, which like that narrative could also yeah. be considered a fantasy. Um, and so that's a big part of it. This exploration of stealing masculine strength and power. Um, but fantasy itself is also an exploration of masculine strength and power. Cause you have man hero goes to get some power and either comes back with it a king or is destroyed by it or some sort of variation on it demonstrates power by conquering other people by stealing magic from other people all of that kind of stuff and um and so and what power does in whose hands and who is the noble and righteous one and who is not and so i think that's a question that i've always been really interested in and like as i got older I just became more and more dissatisfied with the narrative. So like dissatisfied with um, the fact that so often the girl who dresses up as a boy um, accidentally makes some poor hapless girl fall in love with them eventually has to reverse that and go back into the real world. Like the story ends when she goes back into the real world as a proper woman in a dress, maybe occasionally goes off to be a general and then goes back home. Like there's a, in, there's an end almost like putting on the men's clothes is going into a portal world. Like it's going into Narnia and then you take mm -hmm. that off. You, you come, you come out of, you come out of the closet <laughs> and take off the, <laughs> take off the men's clothing. Um, and um, so there, there, th there was that, and that's kind of what I wanted to write. I wanted to write my version of what these stories could be, some like something that satisfied me more in terms of who had the power, what was done with it, uh, and also like 
what you had to look like to have this power. And I mean, part of it is also exploring just like, what is it, what is this, what does our idea of masculine power entail? And um, like this physical might and strength and why is it masculine and, and why is it violent? What other ways could it be used? Like actual physical strength, how can it help? And, um, and not just harm. And I think part of it, like to go back all the way back to exploring things in maybe like a different genre, I think at some point I will, I probably will. I was joking about having um, a rugby novel inside me that I need to write one day. That's awesome. And I think that is, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I think that's a similar thing. It's, it's exploring this this masculine realm of of physical strength that is typically forbidden from people presumed women and and so i think i'll I'll do it one day it's just that fantasy has just like the plots come more readily to me um Mm -hmm. and i you know i think dragons are cool and stuff um but yeah there's just something that i wasn't allowed to have but it felt right and I could explore it really well in fantasy. Mm -hmm. I like what you said about the, you know, a lot of fantasy where it's like, there's this sort of uh, coming out of the closet reversal where it's like, you know, the, the girl who wants to wear boys clothes or, or what have you. But then there's always the regression and the, the reversal back to the sort of status quo kind of thing. And I think Mm -hmm. that's something that right now, so much fantasy and science fiction is doing a good job of saying Mm -hmm. fuck you to that that status quo and letting the reversal happen but allowing a new status quo to develop itself over the course of the story until it finally reaches its end and that is what is established as something that is counter to what came before it's like yeah, I'm not walking back into the closet. Like I'm okay (laughs) out here. You know, I've gone through my hero's journey or my heroine's journey or whatever kind of journey you had to get through to Mm -hmm. reach that end point, but not necessarily like a reversal is met with a reversal and we're back to square one. And what the fuck was the point of the story in the first place kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm, I'm really enjoying, um, that that particular state of things like right now i'm actually i'm reading spear by nicola griffith and it is Mm -hmm. it's everything i would have died for as a kid uh there's this character who is for all intents and purposes a woman but she she has put on her her men's night clothes and um she gets the girls she gets the sword and most people don't know that she's a woman but um it just it just like if it comes up like i.e like before she goes to bed with someone then it comes up but if it Mm -hmm. doesn't then uh, and i I haven't finished it yet so i don't know what what comes later but i'm enjoying it a lot so far nice nice al i'll toss this back to you kind of building on what sheree was talking about in terms of you know in your stories how do you uh, approach something like queerness or sexuality or gender through the lens perspective of something like uh, world building or characters or plot? Um, it varies by book. For me, in a lot of my stories, the, car- the characters just happen to be queer and the plot doesn't involve that other than what the gender of their love and interest is. Mm-hmm. Um, but in my in my Angry Robot debut, World Running Down, the plot revolves heavily around trans themes. Um, my main character, Valentine, desperately wants to transition, but he can't save the money for a visa into Salt Lake City where he'll be able to get back on testosterone and, and medically transition. But uh, the book isn't just about transition in a medical sense. I wanted to mirror Valentine's body dysphoria in his love interest, Osric. Yeah. Um, Osric was a disembodied AI that existed within the city's network, but he's inserted into an android body against his will. And since he's never had a body, he's struggling with that disconnect. And um, so even though there this dysphoria isn't the same between the two characters, it's something that they're able to bond over. And throughout the story, there's this overarching theme of being able to find yourself and explore your identity and mm-hmm. um just being able to live as who you truly are. 
Yeah, and I, I think it's um, really cool that that you have this sort of duality. You know, there's a lot of this in science fiction where it's like the the otherness of uh, artificial intelligence or androids and that kind of thing. Um, but there's not too often uh, a keen exploration of what that means for that entity to be inside of this body or to be inside of a computer or what have you. So I think it's really amazing that you have this opportunity to tell a story where you can have the contrast between the human and the artificial, but have this uh, very poignant overlap between the two and how their experiences are unfolding. And uh, Sheree, I'll toss this to you as well in terms of, you know, characters and world building and how you approach that from a queer perspective. Um, right now, and I think it, it is, it is right now, but it, it might also just be like one of my internal personal pet projects. But I, I, I mentioned before about exploring, you know, masculine physical power and how that is used well, used poorly, that kind of thing. Like, I think right now I'm really interested in exploring the butch lesbian in science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. As opposed to just being in literature in general, because uh, it's a, I feel like we're very underrepresented in in media in in general, um, especially media produced um, by like cishet hegemony of media. Um, Which is why, sorry to interrupt. I think there's a really annoying stereotype about the butch lesbian. It's like hmm. cool. She's got the haircut. She's got the plaid, <laughs> whatever the fuck, like people want to imagine it as, but there's so much more nuance and complexity there. It's ridiculous. There's so much, there's so much, um, like, and that's something I'm really interested in. Like, like we have like, okay, we have the, the butch sword lesbian, which obviously I'm a fan of, but also maybe like we <laughs> have the butch cook or the butch blacksmith or like, who knows what else. And I haven't, I haven't even touched all the other possibilities that I'm interested just in, in like populating these fantasy worlds with um, mm -hmm. just wanting to be there. And I mean, that's also part of, of world building. So I think I have to think about things like, is this a queer norm world? So a world where any, like any like sexuality isn't, necessarily commented on or or like gender transitions are allowed or questioned or magically enabled any kind of thing like that i like these are things that i i consider as i write stories and all, all of that also comes with different societal changes you would have to make so if if for example um women can marry women or men can marry men and it's not challenged how does the how does the royal family find its heirs? Do they not have like a sort of um, hierarchical um, system? Do they have not have a, a birth system? Um, like how how does that change the rest of society? Or how mm -hmm. did the society create a laxness around sexuality and gender? Or what do they do with the cool magic? Um, so that's something I consider in the world building aspect of things as well but i don't always know if um i am actively thinking about the queerness in my world building as the story happens i think i just generally i, I always assume there will be queer people and probably my 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 main characters will be queer in some way um it's just a matter of what kind of story i realize i'm writing and what cool magic, like I said, I have decided exists. And then we kind of build the rest of the world around it. And at some point, mm -hmm. I think like a, a lot of people enjoy the idea of a queer norm world because it does offer an escape from the the stuff we have to deal with in the real world. But sometimes I, I actually just really want to explore the like a character of someone who had to grow up realizing that she was going to get in trouble for dressing this way, but she had to do it anyway. And that she had, she was going to get in trouble for stealing a sword and going to the boy sword classes, but she had to do it anyway. Um, just because that is also something that 
I had to deal with and I would like to explore it, not just necessarily not explore it because it hews too close to real lived experiences and pain and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's an ongoing question. I, I will look forward to answering this again in like five years. <laughs> and by the sounds of it, it's like uh, a bit subconscious in a way. It's like, this is your lived experience. And, you know, it might, it probably happens for you, Al, and, and Rika as well. Um, I think Khan's, is Khan here? No, I think, I think he's dropped out. Yeah. Um, that so much of what your storytelling is for is like your conscious mind as a writer, but your subconscious mind as a human being are sort of intertwining in this way where, uh, like, the, like I said earlier, the process is, uh, one of figuring out your ideas, figuring out how you think about these things. And, and sure for you, it's like some of your characters, it's like, yeah, probably your protagonist is going to be queer because that just feels subconsciously right to you. You know what I mean? And it's not something that you have to just like beat over the head of the reader or yourself as a writer. It's like, this is what's natural to me. And this is what's natural for the story. And you're just going to let it ride out in a way that feels, uh, that feels true. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, uh, Khan, I'll toss this to you as well, uh, in terms of how you approach your queerness or the queerness of your characters or your world building during your writing process? It, well, it really varies um, story by story. The, the, my debut, The Circus Infinite, was very intentionally queer. Um, like I knew, I mean, everybody was just going to be casually whatever sexuality, multiple gender identities. Like it was just, <laughs> I, I knew that from the outset. Um, yeah. I mean, because, you know, it's set on a pleasure moon and it's set in a circus. And I mean, it, it just, a, a very bohemian milieu. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, it would have been weird to not have queer people in such a, in, you know, in such a setting. Yeah. Um, but like the, 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 but the project I'm working on now is, a, is, is really very different. Um, and it's actually something I have to say, it's a, it's a, it's a, question i'm wrestling with right now because i'm feeling like i want to queer it up <laughs> but i'm not <laughs> exactly sure how to like i'm not exactly sure how yeah um you know i, I don't yeah. want to do it in a way that's um you know gratuitous or you, you know just because um but yeah and so so uh, it's 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 very it's a question that's very up for me right now yeah i mean it's like um it just, I mean, as I was mentioning earlier, it's very natural. It's like, whatever the process is for this book, it has to feel natural to the story that you want to tell. And it's like, yeah, you got to do what feels natural to the story, uh, to your characters. And like, if he wants to queer it up and add more queerness to his narrative, but he's not really sure how it's like, you know, perhaps that's a matter of just, uh, going through the drafting process and, and letting it play out. Shrey, do you want to get in on this? I, I, I kind of agree, uh, or maybe it's not so much that I agree, but I, um, I ran into a similar thing. I, I am not especially writing for cis white men with this story <laughs> as many folks who, um, who have read this will, who have read the unbroken will understand. Um, but it is, it is gratifying to see um you know that the story is good enough to get the people who are like very much like in trouble in the story <laughs> like i had i had one straight guy friend be like you know actually he wasn't a friend and he was a little a little butthurt about it but you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> um he was like you know there aren't really any like good guys like good men in your story and i was like oh i uh i didn't notice wait no look at this one and then he was like well he dies <laughs> it's like, well, um, oops. Anyway, moving along. Um, and so to have a, a readership that was not, that was not so bothered by that and still came for the story was, um, was surprising and cool. I mean, that, that's an, that's an important thing when it comes to just storytelling in general, but also characters is like, if you're a straight white guy or if you're just a straight guy or whatever, and you're reading a story and being like, where are all the straight guys? 
or like the one who's there dies or whatever. It's like, that's kind of defeating the purpose of this. This for me, reading is an empathy building exercise. And for me to be able to put myself into the shoes of another person and understand like what their experience might be like as a human being, uh, you know, or in the case of like, uh, uh, you know, a robot who or an Android who's feeling, you know, like they're in the wrong body or something like that. It's like, I can also empathize with that. It doesn't necessarily have to be human. It can also be an alien, what have you. But reading for me is very much about empathy. And so it doesn't matter if the character is exactly me. It's like, I get enough personal representation out in the world as a straight white guy as it is that I can read a story and it doesn't matter who the character is so long as the writer has crafted something that for me is empathetic. And uh, I guess that's the, that's the weird paradox of being human that it's sometimes it's easier for us to deal with uh, otherness or just like whatever it is, it's like some kind of otherness that, that is beyond human. And it's easier for us to connect with that than it is to connect with an actual human being who might have a way of uh, life or sexuality or, you know, what have you, even skin color, all that kind of stuff. I think so. Even though they're human being, it's so much easier for us to identify with like something that is even farther beyond other that we can sort of use it as an avatar as opposed to something that is much more similar to Absolutely. us. Absolutely. I was Should just I thinking that that's exactly it because the, the fake thing will not technically challenge you because it's not real. You don't have to actually mm-hmm. change yeah. your belief system or, heavens forbid, admit that you were wrong um, if the thing is yeah. not real. But if you have to actually deal with a, something that exists in the real world that you might have spoken out against in the real world or that you actually don't agree is as human as you are or as worthy a human as you are, then... You can't, it, you won't identify them with them. You don't want to be made to identify with them. And so it's much better to have a robot who is brass plated and feels, you know, like speaks very properly, like, you know, C-3PO. Like I, I, I know people who are like, well, the, this is the classic whatever, and we can have him, but we can't have, you know, John Boyega or something because that goes against the rules. Mm-hmm. Stormtroopers don't look like that. Um because it's just, it's, I think it's just really that, just an unwillingness to be challenged and then, mm, mm-hmm. eh, it's weak sauce. I have no patience for it. Yeah. And it's like stormtroopers are also a fucking avatar. They have helmets. So whatever goes on underneath, it's like, that's up to your imagination <laughs> for exactly, the most part. Exactly. It's like, why so can't, when they, they unmask why it. Why can't John Boyaga be there? Because then he's a real person. And that's the problem. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Al, since you, you, since your debut novel, since your traditionally uh, published debut novel is with that dichotomy of human and Android, do you want to elaborate on this a little bit in terms of like empathy and, and how we can relate to characters? Well, I think, I think empathy plays a huge role in in fiction. We're able to live the lives of characters that we aren't, that who aren't necessarily like us. And when I was querying one agent, sent me feedback that said that my story helped her understand how it feels to be trans in a deeper way than she had before, even though she has trans loved ones. And she said that she'd remember my story forever. And I was really, I was really touched by that because Mm -hmm. I I just kind of, (laughs) I don't know, like when I, when I first started writing the book, I was, I was writing it for me to get these feelings out. And um, so I kind of, I don't know, I didn't really expect somebody to say that to me and, and, and I don't know why I just never really thought about it but um but that's fantastic and and you know I think often in fantasy and sci-fi there's a tendency to have marginalized representation but it's in a way that's still othering those identities so you could have an asexual character but they're asexual because they're a robot or you have a neurodiverse character who doesn't think like other people but it's because they're an alien and ha- having those kinds of characters is okay but th- there needs to be that human component too i think so that people are are better able to relate to them um but as far as um the dichotomy between my human main character and um my android love interest um valentine my my human main character in world running down he's got a huge heart and 
is extremely selfless. In the in the opening scene, he's digging a grave for an enemy that he didn't even kill just because he thinks that she deserves a burial. And when he receives a job to retrieve missing androids um, with a visa reward upon success, he jumps on the chance. That's what he wants is this visa into the city. Um, but when he discovers that the androids are becoming self-aware and they don't want to return to their lives of abuse back in the city, he risks his own dream of transition in order to help these androids live as their true selves. And on top of that, Osric, his love interest, desperately wants to get out of the android body that he's stuck in. And Valentine fights for Osric's choice, too, even though he can't know exactly what it feels like to be one of the androids or what Osric is going through. That doesn't mean that he can't have empathy for them. I mean, um, you know, for me, it's kind of, it's kind of a tricky thing to, to narrow down because the way that we relate to characters is so personal. And, you know, for me, I think my reading experience has just opened my eyes to the kinds of characters that I can relate to. And especially doing this podcast, because I'm reading so many books by so many different authors and the way that they represent themselves and the way that they represent them, their characters is very unique as much as they are a unique individual, but it's kind of difficult to say like, yeah, the broader market of readers is going to be accepting of any particular thing. Just like, uh, Sheree and Rika, you were mentioning earlier, it's like the broader market likes to perceive themselves as woke and say that, yeah, we're accepting of such and such thing and such and such thing. And then, you know, big companies like Disney are like, yeah, we've got so much inclusivity and so much diversity, but then it's like, okay, but does that diversity and inclusivity uh, feel genuine? Uh, does it extend to not just the people that are on screen, uh, but their roles and, and the role that they play on screen, but also the people who are behind the screen and the way that they are uh, writing the scripts or directing or producing or what have you? So it's a really it's a really complicated thing. But you know, I feel like the only thing that I can do on my part is read more books, buy more people uh, who have, uh, diverse opinions and diverse experiences and that kind of thing. And then at the same time, like host uh, shows like this and, and, you know, hope that the people that are listening open their eyes and their ears a little bit more, you know, and con, do you want to, do you want to get in on this topic? I, 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 th- I think when, uh, I, you know, I mean, I think readers and viewers like to, I mean, this is all just their, you know, supposition, but, um, mm-hmm. like, you know, put themselves in the place of the characters and in some ways that I think is what the challenge is. And it's, it's, it kind of, it, 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 it's running up against like a limit to empathy. Um, and as, I mean, the whole, like, it's easier to, to identify with Chewbacca than it would be, you know, to, to John Boyega's character for mm-hmm. certain people, um, I think is the fact that, you know, um, John Boyega's character, whose name I, Finn, mm-hmm. is that his name? Yep. Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm probably incurring the wrath of, like, Star Wars fans on multiple levels at, yeah. right now. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, I think the fact that he is a human but not a human like them mm-hmm. is, i mean that like that's the challenge because you know they they want to put themselves into the space of the character and when it's too close but different that makes it that somehow makes it harder um I, i'm sorry if that point's been made already but I, no 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 it's perfect I, and Al, um, I'm going to toss something else to you if you want to sort of build on this. I think uh, something that we as humans really relate to are relationships. And in the case of characters, um, Con, you mentioned earlier as well, just sort of this uh, uh, found family nature of the Circus Infinite. And I think that there's a a, com- a commonality in a lot of uh, queer stories where there's a uh, romance plot line. Um, and Al, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure in your, in your book that's coming out next year, there is a romance plotline, correct? Yeah. 
And so for you, do you feel like uh, what what the role of a romance plotline is, if you feel like it's necessary or, you know, when it is used, how can it enhance a story and its characters and how people relate to them? So I don't think that romance is necessary for a queer story. You can have a queer story um, with just these people going through the world, living their lives, because um, I, I feel like, you know, going through the world as a queer person involves more than just whatever relationship you may or may not be having at the time. Um, just, just because of the way you are, your worldview is different and the way you're treated is different. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, my books almost always have romance because it's my favorite part to write, but, um, it seems like the, the romances usually just kind of happen organically. I, Mm -hmm. I, I don't do a lot of, outlining and that sort of thing when I'm writing. And um, I just kind of take, I, I let the the character's personalities kind of evolve and I feel out who they are and then kind of figure out how to um, either increase the, the tension or figure out different things that they can find in common between them based on their uh, personalities. But I, since I've written, um, <laughs> this is not the first time I've written a, a human and AI romance. So, um, <laughs> I think that <laughs> having that experience behind me, I kind of, um, was able to, um, build upon that in this, this next book, things that I, um, enjoyed writing about, you know, exploring AI humanity and, um, and the things that they have in common and the things that are are different between them uh, is something that I really um, enjoy writing about. It, it's been a way for me to safely explore my my own identity and sexuality. And I think that it helps readers do that too. There's, there's people out there who might not be out of the closet yet or who are still trying to figure themselves out. And with the romance present, it might resonate something, you know, um, within them in a way that they didn't expect. And and I think from a craft point of view, the love interest can be the perfect foil for the protagonist. They can mm -hmm. support the protagonist or they can challenge them in ways um, in order to help them move forward with their character arc. Yeah, I completely agree. And Shrey, I know you're a big fan of a good romance. <laughs> so what's your take on that? <laughs> um, well, uh, like Al, I just, I just like it. <laughs> um, but in particular, I like the messed up ones. I like the like um <laughs> uh i like i know this goes back to just negotiations of power again um who's allowed to have it is always a big question and i don't really think that there is such a thing and this is partly also what i'm exploring because I, I i don't know as a completely 100 percent always equal partnership Someone might have more money. Someone might have more social capital. Someone like physically has like has the right looks for moving through society. Um, someone has the right experiential knowledge to get through something. Um, so there's there's always some sort of negotiation of power, and it happens in all relationships. Um, and I like the messiness that comes when there is also a romantic element within that. Yeah. Um, because I think people um, might go to more drastic lengths to deal with, to like maintain even the most unhealthy relationships or romantic relationships. Um, I like writing makeout scenes. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's just a really good story motor. <laughs> like, are they going to kiss? Are they not going to kiss? Yeah. Are they going to get together? Are they going to stay together? It's a good story motor for me personally. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I really, really enjoy just relationships, period. Um, I actually have been joking with some of my friends about um, how The Unbroken is um about mommy issues so about m m like mother <laughs> maternal relationships and then um book two is about daddy issues so all the paternal um relationships um that someone might have in terms of everything from like actual like birth mothers to foster parents to stand-ins um uncles just mentors and how all of that works together um, 
best friends who are not best friends anymore because those relationships like friendships like a close (laughs) friendship can be like they know all of your secrets even more secrets than a romantic partner might so if they're mad at you like ooh, mm, that could be dangerous (laughs) um so i think exactly exactly so i think i'm really just interested in um messy relationships and the power dynamics within them um and if they you know, get mad enough to make out about it, all the better to me personally. But there is a value. In, <laughs> <laughs> there is a value in um, exploring non-romantic relationships as well. And the, like, yeah. also just, I just sorry, I just love <laughs> angry makeout scene. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thinking of of this in a queer context, I mean, so much, so many queer relationships are friendships because we need we need people to help us get out of situations to give us a home where we might not have had them and yeah there is the like very queer sensation of like do i want to be you do i want to bone you i don't know yet so we should bone figure it out oh no we're better just as friends and then you go off and like save the world together but um just all (laughs) all of the possible permutations of relationships i'm interested in yeah. Oh, I love that. Khan, do you want to get in here on in terms of, you know, relationships in general, romance, that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, so for me, the primary relationships that I want to kind of really center um, is like the note is, is really community. Um, and I mean, so in the Circus Infinite, there is a romantic relationship um, that is key to the story, but that's not actually typical mm-hmm. for for my writing. Um, and it kind of just surprised, and it surprised me <laughs> um, that that you know that it happened. Um, but I think that uh, um, you know, a, you know, chosen family is a, you know, a very common trope for queer stories. I think because it's so common in our, in the lived experience uh, of queer people and um, expanding beyond the concept of chosen family a bit is, is the idea of community. And I feel like, um, the whole idea of community is very devalued in our culture right now, um, particularly in, in U.S. society. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of community for a lot of people revolves around their religion and churches, and that might be part of the problem <laughs> um, of what we're uh, I mean, of what we're facing be- uh, in terms of all the anti-trans and anti-LGBT stuff mm-hmm. that's happening right now is that um, the anti-side has really strong community identifications um, and um, gathering spaces with churches and stuff. Yeah. And um, on the more progressive and left side, it feels very fractured. Um, and it's not unified, you know, in in the same way um i mean so and so that's so that's one thread and then just in terms of life in cities you know it you find your group of people and you stick with your group of people and that helps you you know make you feel you know at home but like i can go out i can walk out my apartment and there'll be people from nearby apartment buildings on the street and I have no idea who they are. Um, you know, and, um, I, I'm not sure where exactly I'm going with this. Um, I, 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 I just feel like in, in, in general, we've lost, um, we've lost a, a kind of community connection with folks that are not within our immediate circles. And, it's having a negative ripple effect on just how we conduct our our civic lives and public lives. Yeah. So, so, and so, so, so community and and then as a corollary to that, platonic relationships, um, I think are are 
like really up for me and um where i'm trying to you know figure out how to work those mm-hmm. into my narrative yeah and on that on that note i think science fiction and fantasy just as a, a a form of entertainment for people as a as a form of work or creativity what have you this is kind of like the strange uh like leapfrog community where it's like no matter where you are in the world we can connect like this and uh talk with each other and and not have to um not have to worry about distance but still be able to connect based on the foundation of science fiction and fantasy and our shared love for that you know despite the fact that you know you might not know your neighbors or or what have you like communities are really a really tricky thing. And Rico, do you want to do you want to get in on this uh topic of romance, friendships, community, that kind of thing? Yeah, I want to and I'm going to answer this in a way that I don't usually answer because okay. I still can't get the idea of Shiree's butch blacksmiths <laughs> out of my mind. Uh you know, it's like, "Oh my god, I want to read that." Uh, Give me a few years. <laughs> I think that I would love to I <laughs> as a writer, I have a hard time writing romance because there's a lot of uh, internalized transphobia, seeing oneself as an object of desire. Uh, You know, you see a lot of the romances, you know, um, being trans is always a secret or will break Mm -hmm. a relationship or it it becomes the focus of a relationship and then it lapses into kink and not into romance. And I don't really feel like being somebody else's fetish unless they're paying me well for it. Uh, So, you know, but the idea of just having romance, hot, hot sex and, and romance and being able to lose yourself into the, the heat of the story that that's something that I would love to see where I would love to go out with the butch and knew exactly what to do with a trans woman, you know, had, had the experience, knew what it was, we were good. And I don't have to explain because when you start explaining that just kills your buzz. And, um, I think I would like, like to see stories like that where, um, and this is just me speaking selfishly as a trans woman of color. Um, where where you could have just just a flat romance with no explanation, a lot of good hot and bothered <laughs> stuff, sex and drama and angry sex and makeup sex and you know and things like that that I think a lot of the a uh, lot of cis readers take for granted, even queer ones that you can find lovers who know how your plumbing <laughs> works. Uh, or know how your identity works. Oh, no, no, no. I'm I'm going to go a little bit TMI here. But, you know, I've had people say, you know, oh, I know how to suck a cock. I've sucked a guy's cock before. And it's like, uh, ouch, that really hurts. Different hormones, yeah. body, different. No, not same. And uh, that sort of thing I want to see. I want to see... Um, and I need to learn how to write that. I need to be more comfortable. This challenge for me as a writer too. Uh, my last couple of books have been very much more uh, on the platonic side of things. In fact, you know, uh, you know, in some situations I'm actually demi. But I think that there's a a need for that, and I think that's a frontier where we're going to go. I think when you can. Not when you can see a romance with a trans woman of woman, black trans woman, trans woman of color, and not think trans woman of color, but think hot. I think we've gotten there, and and I'm not sure. I think we're close because I know there's some very good mm-hmm. writers out there, but I want to see more. Yeah, well, that's actually really perfect because I wanted to ask each of you. You know, what are you most uh, impressed by or thankful for in terms of the current? Uh, representations of queerness, gender, sexuality, that kind of thing within the the SFF community. Uh, So, Shreya, I'll toss that to you. (laughs) Um, I think... One one thing I'm, I'm grateful for is just that, you know, there is enough queer literature these days, even in, like, my particular, like primary interest of like sapphic literature there's so much of it that i can be like "Mm, 
that one actually doesn't sound good to me. I'm not going to read it. I'm not, I am no longer so starved for media that I'll take anything. I can be pickier with stuff. Um, But more specifically. At the Sapphic Buffet. (laughs) Exactly. It's a Sapphic. (laughs) Well. We might have to edit that part out. Um, We're keeping that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's like. Like even even more specifically niche, like if we take not just all of the speculative genre, but the stuff that called to me first. So that that classic fantasy, like, you know, your dragon lands, your your Arthurian sagas and stuff, there is now also queer versions of that that I mean, there aren't as many as I would like of that very teeny tiny specific niche. But there are still more like the fact that I can now hone in on that, like specifically is really gratifying to me. Like right now, I I still go back to thinking I'm still thinking about Spear. It's going straight up on my 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 top list. I think of Lady Hotspur by Tessa Grattan. Um, oh, man. Um, Mike Brooks's uh, book, the, the Black, the Black. Ah, uh, I can't think of it right now. I'm blanking on the title. Um, we might have to add it later. Um, no worries. But um, like the, it's just like what I I lovingly call old guard fantasy. Um, is there's there's more of that, but it's queer, like casually queer characters, like throughout, ca- like queer main characters, queer romances. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just happening more often as a matter of course. And, um, yeah, just really enjoying that. That's awesome. And what are your hopes for the future of this, you know, this kind of representation? More, um, just more, but I actually like, (laughs) like Rika, I, I would also like to see, um, queer sexuality more on the page. Mm -hmm. Um, also taken as a matter of course, not something that's like, (gasps) Oh, um, like things from, I, I, uh, I was talking on Twitter with a, a friend about this, just like, like the idea of, of strap-ons in fantasy sex, mm-hmm. like, w- like feasibly that could happen. If we can have dragons, we could have strap-ons. Like it's not hard to invent cause they were invented yeah. in our world in the past. So, um, just, just. Not in every book. I don't think it's a necessity for every story or even every romance, but just for there to be more examples, more, more, uh, more takes on uh, queer sexuality and fantasy. Mm -hmm. And just be creative, people. It's like you can figure out how a dildo (laughs) works. (laughs) Yeah, make it, make it happen. Make it happen. happen. Al, do you want to get in on this? Um, well... I'm very grateful for my book deal. <laughs> I mean, that, that we're even at a, at a point where where I can get one. I mean, when I was querying, I started to feel like nobody wanted my story. It, it was too trans. It wasn't marketable. Um, I got a lot of agent rejections that said things like, I'm not the right, right agent for this kind of story. Um, and once I did get an agent and went on submission, I got a publisher rejection that was similar. Um, they said, I have no idea what to do with this story. So I'm really gl- grateful that I was able to find an agent and a publisher who resonated with my book and took a chance on it and and i feel like right now there's great strides that are being made in having more queer books out there right now um i didn't come out as trans until just a few years ago and i'm autistic and very bad with social situations and so both of those things mean that i don't have the lived experiences of a gay guy that i wish i did so being able to find those characters in books that are that are out there and available right now that I can identify with, whether it's queer cis men or trans men, um, is really important to me. So I'm, I'm glad that those that those books are out there. Yeah. And what are your hopes for the future of this? You know, this kind of I hope to see a lot more of it. Um, I hear like I think that things are improving, but at the same time, I still hear a lot of stories where um, marginalized authors are lamenting that. Uh, you know, this publisher already has one Chinese fantasy this year. They already have one trans book or whatever. And it's like, they don't, they don't 
want to or can't make room for more marginalized voices. And um, I, I think that's improving. And I hope that there's a lot more space for um, queer rep and, and other marginalized people of all kinds in the future. Mm-hmm. Cotton, what about you? What are you most impressed by or thankful uh, for in terms of current representations? And then what would you like to see in the future? Uh, well, I, I kind of feel like we're in a, in a kind of sort of a golden age right now for, for queer speculative fiction. Um, and I am grateful for, um, how many stories are, are being published now and the diversity of the stories. Um, and, you know, the different approaches, the different kinds of relationships, all the different ide- various identities and intersectionalities that, you know, that are presented. Um, and I feel very grateful to be debuting at this time. You know, like my teenage nerd self, like the, the, the breadth of the material that's being published now is mm-hmm. you know, a dream. <laughs> you know, I, I, as a 16 year old nerd, I, could not have imagined this, you know. Um, so, so in a lot of ways, it, it's it's kind of mind blowing. Um, as far as I, for future, I just want to see more. Um, I mean, I don't like I don't know that I have much different to add than what Trey just said, you know. Um, just just more, um, and ultimately, I think what I would love to see is for these kinds of stories to not really be notable. I mean, and they just, Mm -hmm. they're just out there and, and it's, you know, one of the many approaches that sci-fi and fantasy can take. um, And one of the many viewpoints that are out there, but it's not necessarily something to make note of or, you know. Yeah. Like it just, it just feels naturally part of, you know, what we're, what we're reading the key. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. sure, right? Go for it. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I, I did think of something to add. Um, just also thinking a little bit demographically um, in adult fiction. I, I do think that there is um, a surprising, not surprising. That is an incorrect word. Um, but <laughs> a, a very noticeable gap that uh, of like black queer male leads. Um, and I don't think that, like, I've never, like, actually just tallied them up, but when I think through my little mental Rolodex, that is something that I think is missing. That's a good point. Um, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's something, it's definitely something I could, I don't want, I don't want to have to think that this is missing. So I, I just want to just know there is an abundance. So let's add that to the future as well. Um, <laughs> and if anyone, if anyone here knows that there's an abundance or if anyone listening, just put in the comments, it's like, yeah, sure. There is an abundance. So you're all good. And and then just list it out for me. Cause I want it. <laughs> yeah. Just like a huge fucking list. Just go. For it. <laughs> and uh, Rika, what about you in terms of uh, what you're thankful for uh, impressed by right now? I want to make a big shout out to librarians <laughs> because right now um, the the fact that, you know, a lot of, especially in the United States where, you know, there's been a lot of attack on what is proper for people to read, um, librarians have been amazing. They've been heroes getting mm-hmm. books out to to readers who who want them. And I think that I want to see, I, I'm really grateful that People who would otherwise have no problems playing it safe are actually showing how much books mean to people. So I'm just going to specifically for this, because I, I, I think that, you know, Alan Conshoy just did everything, just really covered everything. Just the idea that um, librarians do a very, very good job and they um, they need to be thought of as real heroes. Now, in the future... What I think I would uh, really, what I would like to see is I would like to, and what I'm grateful for and what I'm looking for and hoping for are, you know, librarians and editors and readers 
understanding that there's still a lot of hatred that is directed and there's still a lot of threats towards writers of color mm -hmm. and queer writers that are out there. I hear mm -hmm. stories. I've been the victim of some. And these, these things happen. And we a lot of times you'll never hear about those things in an interview because we kind of just go, well, maybe that's just the way right. it is. But it doesn't have to be. So um, what I am hope but you know one of the times that I'm asking something of readers I usually I'm just thanking but one thing that I would ask is continue to understand that every time you see a queer writer or um, a writer of color or um, out there telling a story that you're not used to there was probably some sort of struggle to get there and um, how do you make it easy if you like that story how do you keep making those stories possible how do you make it easier how do you um, exert agency over your fandom and your community. I think there's a lot of room for that. I, I love what I've already seen and I'd love to see more because there's a lot of great people reading science fiction fantasy out there right now. Yeah, I completely agree. And shout out to all the librarians out there. My librarian in elementary school was awesome. She got me into all kinds of like fantasy. It's like she introduced me to Lemony Snicket, series of unfortunate events, Aww. so much cool stuff. It's like, Shout out to Ms. Brierson. She was fucking awesome. And yeah, completely agree <laughs> that, uh, you know, from the part of readers and from the part of there's so many different there's so many different links in the chain of uh, books being written, edited, published, read, all that kind of stuff. But I think, you know, Rika, what you what you just mentioned is good. It's like understand the context of behind how this thing came to be. And if it's something that you really enjoy, push your love for it. Get on Twitter, be vocal about it. Get on any kind of social media, be vocal about it. And just show your love for the people that are, that are writing stuff that you appreciate. And, you know, trickle effect goes a long way, I think, uh, more than people realize. So. And this is a really special community, science fiction, fantasy fandom. There's so much, act, act, you know, there, there are so many people doing amazing things. It's a very active community. Mm -hmm. And so if any community can do it, it's this one. Yeah, I completely agree. And there's something I just wanted to touch on really quickly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not sure if any of you have any personal experience with it, but sensitivity readers. So we've mentioned, you know, the different people that are involved in the process of getting a book to publication and in people's hands. But uh, have any of you had any experience with sensitivity readers? And if so, uh, you know, what value do you, you feel that they play in the community? Um, and how are they for authors uh, versus, you know, readers, that kind of thing? Does anyone have any input on that? I can go if nobody. Yeah, go for it, Rico. Yeah. I dig sensitive, uh, sensitivity readers. Flight from Uncommon Stars, they asked, do you, you know, would you like to have this thing sensitivity read? And mm -hmm. at first I'm going, hmm, I've got a lot of mark. And then I stop myself going, no, I have a lot of blind spots too. Mm -hmm. And let's see, let's go through it. And my editor and I, we went through and we caught a few things. And the point of a sensitivity reader, too, I think um, we're not going to catch everything um, where mistakes will be made because that's just the nature of being human. But I think if you for me, if I was in good faith, just trying having a sensitivity reader looking at my work. Now, a sensitivity reader, my editor saying their word is is not gospel. They're giving you ideas to, to think about. But I think being open to that just is um, really helped me understand, um, you know, the power of having a book out and, and the good it can do, but also some of the damage it can do through some sort of harm, you know, careless wording and things like that. The other thing that I really love about sensitivity readers is I got to have a non-binary uh, Latina queer person get paid to read my book, mm -hmm. you know, as a sensitivity reader. And if I can take money from one of the big four presses and give it to another queer person of color in my community, oh, you're darn right, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. I think people should demand five, six, you know, uh, Trans sensitivity readers, if that means money gets put <laughs> into our communities. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I just think it's, um, 
they're not they're not the final word on things. They're just trying to help you. Yeah. And if you're going and you're doing it, this is not a place to be proud. This is a place to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, has anyone else had any experience with uh, sensitivity readers, or at least like what, what your what your perception of them is within the the writing community? I think that sensitivity readers are important, no matter what genre of book you're writing. Um, I haven't used them in the past, but I. <laughs> I think about some of the first book the books that I wrote, and I mean, I was still learning back then. We're always improving, and 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 now that I think back on them, um, you know, there's some rep in there that I, I probably could have used a sensitivity reader for because I, I definitely don't want to get the rap wrong. And and I think that if you have a prominent character who isn't like you, you want to make sure that what you're writing isn't harmful. Uh, you might have the best of intentions, but if you get it wrong, it can still hurt people. And we're only our own person and there's experiences and cultures out there that we're never going to get right without the input of someone else who's actually lived it. Um, you know, so you don't want to have it be inaccurate or a cliche that would be worse than whether it, you know, if it wasn't even there at all, I have, um, a book that I'm working on right now that, um, I would like to get a sensitivity reader for probably in the future. And, um, it's not something that I, and focused on in the moment, but I do have that in my mind for something that I probably need later on. Um, as far as authors versus readers, ultimately authors have a duty to get the rep right for the reader. So I think a sensitivity reader might be there to help the author, but it's in consideration of the people who are going to read the book and, and see that representation. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, you know, just to bring the panel to a close, um, I would like each of you to recommend a contemporary book that reflects the possibilities of how queerness can be portrayed in sci-fi and fantasy. So a recommendation that uh, you feel is, you know, indicative of where we're at right now and, uh, you know, can show what the future of, of queer and gender related sci-fi and fantasy can be. So Sheree, I'll toss it to you. Uh, well, I'm going to take the, um, the softball there and I'll just go ahead and recommend Spear. Um, by Nicola Griffith, which is um, not exactly an Arthurian retelling in the sense that it's about um, Arthur, but it is about one of his knights. Um, and um, well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't actually want to talk too much more about it um, <laughs> because I don't want to. I want to let people experience it themselves, but yeah. it's very much in the vein of. Um, her previous book, Hild, and that it explores in an older England, but has takes elements of of the fantastic and magic with it, um, with her trademark gorgeous prose and um, just like these these gorgeous sentences you could just hang out with for hours. Um, and it's a novella um, out with uh, Tor dot com and. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Highly recommend it. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Shrey. I love that. Just like just hang out with those words for a little while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's like the perfect, the perfect way to describe a really good book. And uh Khan, what about you? Uh, a recommendation of of something contemporary that you feel really reflects where queer SFF is at right now. Uh well. She probably doesn't need the plug, but I am a big Charlie Jane Anders stan. Um, I've loved all of her books. Um, they're all quite mm -hmm. different from each other, um, but with the same kind of essential Charlie Jane-ness, I guess yeah. you could say. Um, yeah. Um, and, and she does. So there's a book called All the Birds in the Sky, which is not a space fantasy. Um, but her other books, I would characterize as space fantasy, and uh, they're all they're all pretty spectacular in different ways. Yeah, I second that completely. The City in the Middle of the Night is one of my like favorite modern sci-fi novels. It's fantastic. Al, what about you? Uh, a recommendation of something contemporary? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> I think um, Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas was the first book I read where I really felt seen as a trans guy. Um, I, I don't usually read young adult books, but um, I, I wanted to get that one specifically because of the rep, and I was able to 
relate directly to the gender struggles um, of the main character. And and right now I'm reading Under the Whispering Door by T.J. Klune for actually for the second time in the past week, just because it's such a heartwarming story where the life and relationships and the impact that you have on other people is is shown through the lens of queer characters. And they're just kind of they're just queer. It doesn't really have like a whole ton to do with the plot. But um, and so that's nice to see, too. Nice. And uh, Rika, what about you? A recommendation? It's summer is coming and uh, talking about just having a book that you can just hold and enjoy. I would recommend um, Everina Maxwell. Mm. Um, She has a book called Winter's Orbit, which is this really cool derpy romance and it's queer (laughs) and it's fun and it just hits you in all the right places. Uh, I would suggest that uh, she's got another book out called Ocean's Echo that I think is out now. And I read the advance for that. That was another one that's just, Everina's just got this, you just want to like spend a summer, you know, a summer afternoon, you know, under, under an umbrella, just reading her work and drinking shochu. So um, I would suggest, you know, when I think about queer literature as something you read, not necessarily for because you want to learn, but because you want to have a nice warm hug and a good time. I can't think of anybody better than Everina's work. That sounds fantastic. It's on my TBR. Winner's Orbit is on my Yeah, TV. I also second mm. Everina. <laughs> and- I love I love how you describe it as derpy fantasy. I'm like or derpy romance. Sorry, that's just like <laughs> it's so derpy and it's so <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! And uh, just to wrap things up, I'm a devout mycophile. I love mushrooms, uh, but I want to end with a quote that really spoke to me. I've, I'm currently reading a book by Merlin Sheldrake uh, called Entangled Life, which is all about fungi, uh, where he muses on the sexuality of lichen, and I think this is something that. Uh, might help us to open our minds a little bit, uh, you know, question the rigid frameworks of the past and and the present and simply, you know, look to the weird, weird world of fungi for inspiration. And so it goes like this. Lichens are queer beings that present ways for humans to think beyond a rigid binary framework. The identity of lichens is a question rather than an answer known in advance. And so I will end things on that and and just say I'm really, really thankful to all of you for joining me today. And it means so much that you came onto the show, shared your experiences, uh, you know, experiences that are very personal to you. Uh, and I really appreciate it. And I, I learned a lot. So thank you so much. And um, if you could please let viewers and listeners know where they can find you on social media, I'll start with you, Sheree. You can find me at uh, C L Clark rights.com uh as my website and also uh for twitter it's at c underscore l underscore c l a r k awesome thank you so much and rika where can people find you on social media well my website is my first name rika rika twice so rika rika.com and my twitter would be Rika Aoki with an underscore between the the two A's. So R-Y-K-A underscore A-O-K-I at Twitter. And once you get there, you can hit my link tree and we can go. But um, thank you. Yeah, thank you too. And Khan, what about you? Uh, My website is KhanWong.com. And my Twitter handle is CosmicKhan, as one word. And in my Twitter bio, there is also a link tree and there's links. <laughs> um, so, so, <laughs> and I love, Con, I love your, like I that. love your Twitter handle, by the way. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Al, where can people find you on social media? Yeah. Um, my website is alhessauthor.com and that has links to all of my books um to my social media you can subscribe to my newsletter um and i even have um uh, art galleries of my characters with like brief little bios of, of each of the characters for world running down and for some of my other books on there too so um yeah pretty much got everything right there 
Awesome. And his new work or his new book, uh, World Running Down, is coming out uh, March 2023. So yeah, make sure to go check that out and check out the work from all of the authors on this panel because they're all fantastic. And I'm so thankful that you all spent this time and hanging out with me and and chatting and and sharing your experiences. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Adrian. Take care, everyone. Bye.